separate and classify the various kinds and qualities of candy in a mixed heap of the article. All at once the town was thrown into a state of extraordinary excitement. In mining parlance, the wide west had struck it rich. Everybody went to see the new developments, and for some days there was such a crowd of people about the wide west shaft that a stranger would have supposed there was a mass meeting in session there. No other topic was discussed but the rich strike, and nobody thought or dreamed about anything else. Every man brought away a specimen, ground it up in a hand mortar, washed it out in his horn spoon, and glared speechless upon the marvelous result. It was not hard rock, but black, decomposed stuff, which could be crumbled in the hand like a baked potato, and when spread out on a paper exhibited a thick sprinkling of gold and particles of native silver. Higby brought a handful to the cabin, and when he had washed it out, his amazement was beyond description. Wide West stock soared skywards. It was said that repeated offers had been made for it at a thousand dollars a foot and promptly refused. We have all had the blues, the mere sky blues, but mine were indigo now, because I did not own in the Wide West. The world seemed hollow to me, and existence a grief. I lost my appetite, and ceased to take an interest in anything. Still, I had to stay, and listen to other people's rejoicings, because I had no money to get out of the camp with. The Wide West Company put a stop to the carrying away of specimens, and well they might, for every handful of the ore was worth a sum of some consequence. To show the exceeding value of the ore, I will remark that a 1,600 pounds parcel of it was solid just as it lay, at the mouth of the shaft, at one dollar a pound, and the man who bought it packed it on mules 150 or 200 miles over the mountains to San Francisco, satisfied that it would yield at a rate that would richly compensate him for his trouble. The Wide West people also commanded their foremen to refuse any but their own operatives permission to enter the mine at any time or for any purpose. I kept up my blue meditations, and Higby kept up a deal of thinking too, but of a different sort. He puzzled over the rock, examined it with a glass, inspected it in different lights and from different points of view, and after each experiment delivered himself in soliloquy of one and the same unvarying opinion in the same unvarying formula. It is not Wide West Rock. He said once or twice that he meant to have a look into the Wide West shaft if he got shot for it. I was wretched and did not care whether he got a look into it or not. He failed that day and tried again at night, failed again, got up at dawn and tried, and failed again. Then he lay in ambush in the sagebrush, hour after hour, waiting for the two or three hands to adjourn to the shade of a boulder for dinner. He made a start once, but was premature. One of the men came back for something, tried it again, but when almost at the mouth of the shaft, another of the men rose up from behind the boulder, as if to reconnoiter, and he dropped on the ground and lay quiet. Presently he crawled on his hands and knees to the mouth of the shaft, gave a quick glance around, then seized the rope and slid down the shaft. He disappeared into the, in the gloom of a side drift, just as a head appeared in the mouth of the shaft and somebody shouted, Hello, which he did not answer. He was not disturbed anymore. An hour later he entered the cabin, hot red and ready to burst with some smothered excitement and exclaimed in a stage whisper, I knew it. We are rich. It's a blind lead. I thought the very earth reeled under me. Doubt, conviction, doubt again, exaltation, hope, amazement, belief, unbelief. Every emotion imaginable swept in wild procession through my heart and brain, and I could not speak a word. After a moment or two of this mental fury, I shook myself to rights and said, Say it again? 
It's a blind lead. Cal, let's, let's burn the house or kill somebody. Let's get out where there's room to hurrah. But what is the use? It is a hundred times too good to be true. It's a blind lead for a million. Hanging wall, foot wall, clay casings, everything complete. He swung his hat and gave three cheers, and I cast doubt to the winds and chimed in with a will. For I was worth a million dollars and did not care whether school kept or not. But perhaps I ought to explain. A blind lead is a lead or ledge that does not crop out above the surface. A miner does not know where to look for such leads, but they are often stumbled upon by accident in the course of driving a tunnel or sinking a shaft. Higby knew the wide west rock perfectly well, and the more he had examined the new developments, the more he was satisfied that the ore could not have come from the wide west vein. And so had it occurred to him alone of all the camp, and there was a blind lead down in the shaft, and that even the wide west people themselves did not suspect it. He was right. When he went down the shaft, he found that the blind lead held its independent way through the wide west vein, cutting it diagonally and that it was enclosed in its own well-defined casing rocks and clay. Hence, it was public property. Both leads being perfectly well-defined, it was easy for any miner to see which one belonged to the Wide West and which did not. We thought it well to have a strong friend, and therefore we brought the foreman of the Wide West to our cabin that night and revealed the great surprise to him. Higby said, we are going to take possession of this blind lead, record it and establish ownership, and then forbid the Wide West Company to take out any more of the rock. You cannot help your company in this matter. Nobody can help them. I will go into the shaft with you and prove to your entire satisfaction that it is a blind lead. Now we propose to take you in with us and claim the blind lead in our three names. What do you say? What could a man say who had an opportunity to simply stretch forth his hand and take possession of a fortune without risk of any kind and without wronging anyone or attaching the least taint of dishonor to his name? He could only say, agreed. The notice was put up that night and duly spread upon the recorder's books before 10 o'clock. We claimed 200 feet each, 600 feet in all, the smallest and compactest organization in the district, and the easiest to manage. No one can be so thoughtless as to suppose that we slept that night. Higby and I went to bed at midnight, but it was only to lie broad awake and think, dream, scheme. The floorless, tumble-down cabin was a palace. The ragged, gray blankets, silk, the furniture, rosewood, and mahogany. Each new splendor that burst out of my visions of the future whirled me bodily over in bed, or jerked me to a sitting posture, just as if an electric battery had been applied to me. We shot fragments of conversation back and forth at each other. Once Higby said, When are you going home? To the States. Tomorrow with an evolution or two ending with a sitting position. Well, no, but next month at furthest. We'll go on the same steamer. Agreed. A pause. Steamer of the 10th? Yes. No, the 1st. All right. Another pause. Where are you going to live, said Higby? San Francisco. That's me. Pause. Too high, too much climbing from Higby. What is? I was thinking of Russian Hill, building a house up there. Too much climbing. Shan't you keep a carriage? Of course, I forgot that. Pause. Cal, what kind of a house are you going to build? I was thinking about that. Three-story and an attic. But what kind? Well, I don't hardly know. Brick, I suppose. Brick, bosh. Why, what's he, what is your idea? Brown stone front, French plate glass, billiard room off the dining room, statuary and paintings, 
shrubbery and two acre grass plot. Greenhouse, iron dog on the front stoop. Gray horses, Landau, and a coachman with a bug on his hat. By George. A long pause. Cal, when are you going to Europe? Well, I hadn't thought of that. When are you? In the spring. Going to be gone all summer? All summer. I shall remain there three years. No. But are you in earnest? Indeed I am. I will go along too. Why, of course you will. What part of Europe shall you go to? All parts. France, England, Germany, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Syria, Greece, Palestine, Arabia, Persia, Egypt, all over, everywhere. I'm agreed. All right. Won't it be a swell trip? We'll spend forty or fifty thousand dollars trying to make it one, anyhow. Anyway, another long pause. Higby, we owe the butcher six dollars, and he has been threatening to stop our hang the butcher. Amen. And so it went on. By three o'clock we found it was no use, and so we got up and played cribbage and smoked pipes till sunrise. It was my week to cook. I always hated cooking. Now I abhorred it. The news was all over town. The former excitement was great. This one was greater still. I walked the streets serene and happy. Higby said the foreman had been offered $200,000 for his third of the mine. I said I would like to see myself selling for any such price. My ideas were lofty. My figure was a million. Still, I honestly believed that if I had been offered it, it would have had no other effect than to make me hold off for more. I found abundant enjoyment in being rich. A man offered me a $300 horse and wanted to take my simple unendorsed note for it. That brought the most realizing sense I had yet had that I was actually rich, beyond shadow of doubt. It was followed by numerous other evidence of a similar evidences of a similar nature among which I may mention the fact of the butcher leaving us a double supply of meat and saying nothing about money. By the